Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, uh, this is uh, Fusion Mobile e-learning center. And I remember my humble self, I'm Olajide Oshitobi. I'm popularly called uh, Smoking Brain by uh, some of my colleagues, by those that know me well anyway. And today, as we've been doing uh, uh, before now, we're still on biology and we'll be looking at a uh, basic ecological system. So here are my outlines. We'll be looking at the meaning of ecology. We're looking at the ecological concept, the various ecological concepts, so to speak. We're looking at the component of an ecosystem. We're looking at our own very, our very own biomes, rather. Those are the biomes in Nigeria, local biomes, so to speak. And we'll be looking at factors that are affecting population on a smaller scale and on a larger scale. Then lastly, we'll be looking at soil and soil factors. Uh, it promises to be uh, explicit and explicit, trust me. Uh, so let's move on. Basic ecological system. Uh, the first question for today is, uh, what is ecology? What is ecology? I'm quite sure you're familiar with the word uh, ecology. Uh, basically, from SS1, uh, 2, 3, or there about you that have been taught ecology. Now, ecology uh, simply talks about something that is so special, uh, but yet it is somehow complicated. Uh, so I would uh, really love you to pay attention, close attention. Now the word ecology is derived from the Greek word oikos. The word ecology is derived from the Greek word oikos. The word oikos simply means dwelling place. The word oikos means dwelling place. Just like I'm standing now, this is my oikos, this is my, my dwelling place, where I reside, where I carry out functions and every other thing. Uh, so in the course of the class, we'll be looking at, at different words. Some words will be coming to you, they'll be very, very strange. It will probably be as if you should run away, but don't run away. And that's actually the beginning of success. So let's come back. Now, ecology uh, can basically be defined as the interaction between living, between living organisms and their non-living environment. Uh, whenever we talk about ecology, we talk about two components. We talk about a living component and a non-living component. Now, what is the living component here? Yeah, those are the living organisms. You and I. Those are the living what, organisms, you and I. Why the non-living organism talks about the environment, where we dwell, how we interact with them. Are you with me? So the interaction between living organisms and the environment is what we call ecology. Again, ecology is derived from the Greek word oikos. It means dwelling place. Dwelling place, where they dwell. Dwelling place. Never forget this. And I said it talks about the interaction between living components and their non-living environment. You and I know what social studies. Social studies is the study of man and his environment. But uh, ecology here is far beyond social studies. It is not just man. It is plant. It is animals. It talks about decomposers interacting uh, with the environment. Now, having established the fact of what ecology is, uh, we are now going to be looking at the the two major groups of ecology. Ecology is basically divided into two major groups are uh, one of them is called okay one of them is called horticology why the other one is called synecology now let's look at these words uh carefully alti sign now the word horticology uh, talks about studying things that are actually single Talking about uh, the study of single species in relation uh, to their environment. It talks about uh, you studying goats generally in relation to the environment. It talks about you studying tilapia fishes in relation to the environment. It talks about you uh, studying man, man, as in uh, man in relation to the environment. Okay, for example, now uh, you happen to be in a class, a class of four boys and eight girls. And the teacher comes in and the teacher is teaching. Now, obviously, that class has how many species? One. One. Male and female, they are one species. Now, the concept of male and female refers to gender. Gender is not species. They are just one species, but different gender. Don't ever mix it up. They are one species. So when you study a uh, primary three class uh, in relation to the environment, the chairs and the blackboard and all that, we'll call it what? Horticology. The study of single species in relation to the environment. When you study black rats, ratus, ratus, that comes in, uh, into your daddy's cupboard to uh, uh, destroy stuff and every other thing, you're studying horticology. The study of that rat in relation to that cupboard. A rat, a black rat, a particular rat. Okay, class. Synecology talks about uh, uh, the study of 
interrelated organisms are relating with the environment. If in a particular class or in a particular abode or a dwelling place, uh, we have uh, men there, uh, we've got goats there, and we have uh, uh, lions there. Now, basically, we're talking about three different species. Uh, a man is a particular species, goat is another species, a white lion is another species. So they are all interacting with that particular environment. And you know what will happen? Our lion will feed on goat. <laughs> and then the, when the lion is feed, or he might actually feed on man, or man will kill the lion. The smarter will win the day. Now, psychology talks about what uh, the study of what uh, multiple organisms interacting with the environment is the it, it, it study something that is complex or to call it, it talks about something that is very very simple you study a single species in relation to the environment tilapia fish in relation to a particular pond a black rat in relation to probably your dad's comfort or your room as the case may be psychology talks about studying two or more organisms in relation to the environment so these are the two subgroups of ecology again these are the two subgroups of ecology ecology talks about single species psychology talks about complex species two or more species interrelating with themselves as well as their environment now let's quickly move forward let's look at ecological concept but before we get to ecological concept uh, a question will pop up on your screen uh, uh, do the needful you know what to do if you have been following me thus far you need to answer the questions uh, and if you feel there are some that are not that clear just go back and uh, go through video okay welcome back ecological concepts now the word concept what does it mean the word concept talks about those terms that are very that are uh, very much applicable to ecology those terms that you would come across in the course of this teaching and that's why we target as what ecological concept now there are a few of those concepts but i'll try as much as possible to bring simplicity to it ecological concept now number one of the ecological concept is what we call the biosphere the biosphere and now the biosphere what does it mean it's very very easy to do and now one thing i usually do is i always advise my students to uh, try as much as possible to learn to uh, look for the root words of a particular word to try as to be able to break down words complex words into bits now let's break biosphere down into Bit biosphere. Let's break it down into bit. We have uh, what we call bow and what we call sphere. So we have sphere and we have bow. Now sphere talks about uh, a place, a particular region, a location. It talks about uh, a position, and that's what sphere refers to. It refers to a position, uh, a place, or a particular location, or simply say a dwelling place. The word bow from the word biology. Uh, let's quickly go back to our Greek word, baos. It means a life. Now, in totality, uh, joining these two definitions together, you and I know that we would only result to having what? A particular portion of the earth cross that is what? Uh, uh, that is being colonized by life. Biosphere. Biosphere is that portion of the earth cross where living organisms live. Where you and I live, where we dwell, is what we call biosphere. Again, biosphere is that portion of the earth cross where living organisms live, where they dwell, where they carry out their functional role. Basically, that portion of the earth cross is what we call biosphere. It's what we call what? Biosphere. Now, the number two of it is what we call the what? The number two of it is what we call the lithosphere. The lithosphere. Now, using the same style, the lithosphere. Yeah, using the same style, we would break down lithosphere uh, into two. Okay, I know you're, uh, you're enjoying the class. So, sphere is a portion, a location, or a dwelling place. Now, litho talks about something that is solid. It talks about uh, rocks. It talks about mountains. Uh, uh, what the, it talks about stones. So, lithosphere is simply the, word, the solid portion of the earth cross. Again, lithosphere is the solid portion of the earth cross. Again, lithosphere is the solid portion of the earth cross. It talks about areas such as rocks, uh, mountains, hills, it is sea. Now, it is also worthy of note uh, that lithosphere comprises 30% of the earth cross. Now, the vastness of the earth cross, uh, how big and how large it is, a lithosphere occupies 30% of it. How many percentage again? 
Thank you very much. Lithosphere occupies 30% of the Earth's crust. 30% of the Earth's crust. Never forget this. 30% of the Earth's crust. And it is occupied by rocks, mountains, and eaves. As a matter of fact, this particular point where I'm standing upon now is what we call the what, uh, the lithosphere, the solid portion. Because over time, even the lithosphere has been colonized uh, by living organisms. It has been invaded by living organisms. So that's what we call the what, the lithosphere. So the next one uh, is what we call uh, which is number three, it's what we call the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere. Now, see, dwelling on the same techniques, uh, we write out what? Hydrosphere. Okay, then we break it down uh, into a uh, bit, or we can say we break it down into biscuit and what? Banana. Now, breaking it down, it will be sphere and hydro. Now, sphere, as usual, is what? Location, okay? Okay, position and all that. Thank you very much. So that's fair. Now the word hydro talks about what? Water. The liquid portion. So joining it together in all totality, we can then say safely that hydrosphere is the portion of the earth's crust that is occupied by water. The portion of the earth's crust that is occupied by water is what we call hydrosphere. It speaks of the oceans. It speaks uh, of lakes. It speaks of ponds. Uh, it speaks of rivers and all that. Are you doing now, uh, it is even known that this, uh, this particular concept that you, uh, you get to hear of uh, mommy water and all that. Uh -huh. So if truly there is anything like mommy water, so we're, we're talking about those organisms that inhabit the hydrosphere. But we're not going there. So basically now, hydrosphere now talks about water. It talks about the portion of the Earth's crust that is occupied by water. So if the lithosphere is 30%, then mathematically, it is safe to say that the hydrosphere is what? 70%. Are you with me? So the hydrosphere is what? 70%. The hydrosphere is what? 70%. The hydrosphere is what? 70%. Why the lithosphere is what we call what? 30%. Now this particular point is characterized by oceans, lakes, ponds, and what? Rivers. So now let's move to the fourth one. The fourth one is what we call atmosphere. The fourth one is what we call what? The atmosphere. Now, so far we've looked at uh, the biosphere, the part of the Earth's crust that is occupied by living organisms. We look at the lithosphere, which is the solid part of the Earth's crust. We look at the hydrosphere, which is the liquid portion of the Earth's crust. And I made mention of the fact that lithosphere occupies 30% of the Earth's crust, or hydrosphere occupies what we call 70% of the Earth's crust. Now, let's look at the atmosphere. Now, majority of us are familiar with the word atmosphere, but funny uh, as it seems, we don't really know what atmosphere is. So I will do justice to that. Now, the word atmosphere is a gaseous envelope that surrounds the earth now it has been uh, a, a major disputing factor uh, among geographers uh, they say the earth is spherical the earth is this the earth is that well let's just go with the fact that the earth is what spherical it depends on how uh, the sphericality of the shape you're referring to uh, well let's just go with the fact that the earth is spherical now the part that is surrounding the earth is what we call the world the atmosphere now this is the earth why this is the world the atmosphere it is a gas envelope that surrounds the head so basically there's no way we'll talk about atmosphere without talking about the concept of air so let's look at it the concept of air again the atmosphere is the gaseous envelope that surrounds the head now what is air then air a i r air is a mixture of gases it is a mixture of gases it has gas a gas b gas c gas c gas d all together in one particular envelope Air is a mixture of gases. Now, what are those notable gases that are present in the air? Uh, they are uh, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon four oxide. Uh, we have red gases, carbon four oxide, red gases. Uh, we have dust particles. And uh, we have what we call water vapor. So, let me show you a chart, an interesting chart. Now, if this is the shape of the earth, we have nitrogen. Now, in the atmosphere, nitrogen is 78% in the atmosphere. Now, we have oxygen. Oxygen is 21%. Never forget, nitrogen is 78%, oxygen is 21%. Uh, we have uh, CO2. Now, CO2 is 0.03%. Again, Nitrogen is 78%, oxygen is 21%, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, is 0.03%. And lastly, we have the rare gases, rare gases, we have dust, 
and we have water vapor and all that that one is 0 0.96 percent now should it be that you have been asked uh, a question as to uh, name three gases that are very very abundant in nature now number one of it is what nitrogen which is 78 percent number two is oxygen which is 21 percent why number three is what red gases it is not carbon fox yeah, it is what red gases red gases and which of the red gases the notable ones are uh, the notable red gases are neon helium argon krypton and xenon we also have radon they are actually more than this ah uh, but it is uh, worthy of note uh, that the most abundance of them in nature is argon is what argon so on the hierarchy of abundance nitrogen followed by oxygen then followed by what uh, argon thank you very much now don't forget nitrogen is 78 percent oxygen is 21 percent carbon dioxide is 0.03 percent uh, red gases are uh, which are neon helium argon krypton xenon and every other one water and dust particles are 0.96 uh, percent thank you very much now again air is a mixture of gases air has got gases it is a mixture of gases so so far we've looked at biosphere we looked at ah uh, and now one thing i want you to know is that another name for biosphere is what we call ecosphere 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 is another name for biosphere we've looked at lithosphere uh we've looked at hydrosphere we've looked at uh hydrosphere okay now we're looking at atmosphere now the atmosphere also has what we call layers atmosphere has layers but we'll just uh, give you uh, two of the layers of the atmosphere though they are more than two they are up to five the atmosphere has layers the layers are stratosphere stratosphere and what we call ionosphere ionosphere so make sure uh you get conversant with this are you with me get conversant it is very very important to get to know there are layers that are very very close to the earth there are some that are further away from the earth so we have the stratosphere and we have the ionosphere again air contains nitrogen oxygen carbon dioxide red gases dust particles water vapor atc so we'll now move to the next one which is uh the the fifth one if i'm not mistaken so that one is what we call habitat okay so now we'll be looking at habitat now habitat uh is a kind of place where living organisms live that's just the definition. It's very, very easy. Your house address, uh, uh, you live at number 59 Martin Street. That is your habitat. Are you with me? Your dwelling place is your habitat. A kind of place where living organisms live. Now, it is also, uh, mm, it is also good to uh, point out the fact that some organisms uh, live in water. Some organisms live on land. While some organisms live on trees. Now, on that note, habitat is subdivided into three. We have what we call the aquatic habitat. Aquatic habitat. We have what we call the terrestrial habitat. Then lastly, we have what we call the arboreal habitat. Aquatic habitat talks about organisms that live on water. Terrestrial habitat talks about organisms that live on land. Arboreal habitat talks about organisms that love flight. So basically, uh, the leaf on the tree. Are you with me? Again, there are basically three types of habitat. We have aquatic, we've got terrestrial, we have arboreal. Aquatic uh, talks about organisms that live uh, in water. Uh, we have fishes, uh, we have crabs, we have prawns, uh, we have oysters. We even have a, a, a particular mammal, which is a whale, the blue whale. And blue whale happens to be the largest mammal on earth. The largest aquatic mammal and the largest mammal overall on earth. So on the ter on terrestrial, we talk about organisms that live on land. Just like me, I'm an organism that stays on land. I will have arboreal these are organisms uh, that live on trees uh, such as birds uh, monkeys and all that are you doing? so basically we're done with what habitat now the next one we're going to be looking at is what we call ecological niche ecological niche ecological niche ecological niche ecological niche uh, now you need to be very very careful not to jumble up uh, the definition of ecological niche with habitat now i said habitat is a, a dwelling place of an organism a place where living organisms live but ecological niche is not uh, just a place where living organisms live it is the functional role being carried out by that organisms are you with me okay i made mention of the fact that we have abori habitat organisms that stays on trees now let's imagine now that uh, we have uh, uh, we've got a particular tree we have a particular tree uh, the tree have got branches the tree the tree has branches 
Okay, this is the top of the tree. Uh, this is uh, a particular tree. These are leaves and branches. Now, if uh, on a normal day the birds uh, tend to sleep here, this is where they sleep. This is where they sleep. Me? Now, the ecological niche is not just uh, the dwelling place uh, of a particular organism. Now, if during the day these birds come down, they feed on leaves, then probably uh, at night they tend to like look for brooms to build their nest for their young ones. Now, the functional role carried out by an organism in its habitat is called ecological niche ecological niche now where i'm standing now is my ecological where i'm standing now is my habitat this particular place is my dwelling place is my habitat now the function that i'm carrying out like teaching uh okay uh, speaking out loud uh, like moving here and there is what we call ecological niche that bed feeding on the leaf the bed going to get uh, brooms, sticks, and all that just to make up uh, a kind of nest for its offspring. It's what we call ecological need. The functional role. Okay, now you're in your mommy's kitchen. That place is called habitat. You washing the plate is called ecological niche. The functional role, the ecological duties that you carry out uh, day in, day out is what we call what? Ecological niche. It's what we call what? Ecological niche. So the next concept is what we call population. Okay, population. What is population? Now, in biology, population is the total number of organisms of the same species. Total number of organisms of the same species that are living in a particular area at a particular time. Now, without the concept of time, there is no concept of population because we need to know the total number of organisms of the same species at a particular time. Okay, in 1990, we have 27 beds. Uh, in 2006, uh, we have 56 chimpanzees. That's what we call what, population. Population uh, is something that you need to get conversed with. One major factor, one major attribute uh, of population is that it is the study of organisms of the same species. The same species. Now, when you study uh, the number of, uh, okay, when you study the number of black rats, in an environment at a particular time it is what we call population but when you study number of black rats uh, number of goats a uh, number of uh, probably pigs at a particular time it is not called population it is not population again obviously you're looking at theory different population are you with me so that means what population of birds uh, what population of goats uh, what population of rats so it talks about different population but population as an entity population as a concept is a study of what a particular group of organisms when you study man humans generally male and female that's what we call population when you study birds generally it's what we call population when you study tigers it's what we call population when you study monkeys it's what we call population however when you study tiger and monkey it is not just one population you are studying two different populations are you with me so now when you study two different populations what are you studying you're studying what we call community you're studying what we call what? Community. So it is safe to say that the combination of two or more species of organisms at a particular time is called community. Community is a study of organisms uh, of different species, not just one species, different species. You're studying blue whale, which is a mama. You're studying fishes, uh, uh, generally that's another species. You're studying two different species in relation to their revenant area. So basically, we can say that is what community. So community talks about what organisms of different species. Uh, no wonder when you get to the forest, uh, you see trees, uh, you see more monkeys uh, uh, you see tiger you see us you see different organisms so when you study different organisms in relation to them, it's what we call what community the study of different species organisms of different species at a particular time is what we call what community now community can also be called biomes it can also be called biomes and extensively speaking biome is a large terrestrial community of organisms a large terrestrial community of organisms now these are the points uh, that you need to know now lastly one major point i would love to give you is what we call species because i've been making use of the word species thus far and uh, it looks as if it has become an household name uh, for those in uh fusion mobile e-learning platform so i would actually let you in on the gist uh, so that it won't be that strange to you now the word species s-p-e-c-i-e-s -E -E what does it mean now the word species are organisms or group of organisms that can interbreed and bring up variable young ones. Oh, grammar. So let me try as much as possible to break it down. This is what I'm trying to say. I'm a particular species. I can 
uh, get married to a female today, we can interbreed and bring up offsprings. Now, the offsprings that we will bring up will not have the same, it may, it may have the same genotype with us, but there is bound to be variation. We are not going to have 100% attributes, same, same, no. We might probably have 100 to 98, yeah, we might have uh, 98 to 100, but there will be variation. So organisms are, that can interbreed, that can actually breed together, that can bring up offsprings that are variable in nature, variable in characteristics or attributes is what we call species. Again, species are organisms or group of organisms that can interbreed, interbreed, interbreed. They can reproduce, they can actually sleep together, exchange sperm cells and other. They can interbreed and bring up variable young ones. Just like your mom and dad, they are one particular species and they actually brought you up. Are you with me? Just like uh, a male monkey sleeping with a female monkey and giving birth to another monkey is what we call what? species. Species are organisms that can interbreed and bring up variable young ones. Now there is something that you need to know and there's something that you need to run with. Now this particular thing I want to tell you now is more important than your name. Yes, even than your name. So you have to hold on to it, hold on to it very well. Now uh, the functional unit of ecology, the functional unit of ecology. For the last time, the functional unit of ecology is what we call what? The species. Species is the bedrock of ecology. Without species, there is no ecology. Without species, there is no community. Without species, there is no population. Without species, there is no power sphere. Without species, there is no lithosphere. Without species, there is no hydrosphere. So species is the functional unit. The functional unit. The functional unit of an ecosystem. Never forget this fact. It is very, 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 very important. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're looking at the components of an ecosystem. Now, what do I mean by the word component? I, I meant uh, those things that make up an ecosystem, those things that are predominant in an ecosystem. Whatever these factors are there, we can safely say this is an ecosystem. Now, the component of an ecosystem are subdivided into two. What are the living components? And what are the non-living components? The living component is called the biotic component. It's called the biotic component or factor. Why the non-living component is called the abiotic component or factor. Are you with me? I said it's so very to have the living component and the non-living component. The living component is called the biotic component or factor. Why the non-living component is called the abiotic factor. Now what do I mean by a biotic component? It talks about the factor that is living. It talks about the, the living organism present in that environment. It talks about an attribute that is affiliated with life. Now whenever we talk about non-living component, we talk about a biotic factor, a factor that is not living. Now basically, whenever you hear the word abiotic component, what must come to your mind is the environment. Are you with me? What must come to your mind is the environment. The environment talks about what? A biotic factor. The environment is not living. It is non-living. However, it determines uh, the movement of living organisms. It determines how well the organisms will feed. It determines uh, how well the organism will breed. It determines the, the functionality or the efficiency of living organisms. So that's how powerful the environment is, despite the fact that it is not living. Yet, it is controlling living, living organisms. Uh, Thank you very much. So the biotic component is living. Now let's look at it critically. What are the biotic components in the ecosystem? What are the biotic components in the ecosystem? What are the biotic components in the ecosystem? The biotic components in the ecosystem are what we call the producers, what we call the consumers, and what we call the decomposers. What we call the producers, what the consumers, I want the decomposer, the producers, the consumers, I want the decomposer. Now let's quickly look at this on the last scale. Okay, so we have grasses. I will have goat and I will have man. Now, this is what we call the food chain. It is a linear feeding relationship. The word linear means one way, uh, a straight pattern. There are no branches. So, it is a linear feeding relationship. Now, we have grasses, uh, from grasses to goat, from goat uh, to man. Now, you and I know that grasses are autotrophic in nature. 
They carry out autotrophic nutrition, they manufacture their food by themselves. And so goat uh, depends on grasses. Why man depends on goat according to this particular food chain? Now grasses here are called producers. They are called what? Producers. They are called producers. They manufacture their food themselves. Now goats here, they are called consumers. They are called what? Consumers. However, when you look at it, because this is the first consumer we are coming across, we call it what? Primary consumer. Now, just like you can never get to secondary school without going through primary school. I don't know if it's possible now, but on a normal day, you cannot get to secondary school without going to primary school. So this is called primary consumer. One man here is also another consumer, but we call this one secondary consumer. Are you with me? So what happens is this goat feed on grass, this man feed on goat. One day, this man will die. Now when this man dies, the man will decompose. Are you with me? When this man dies, organisms will act on the man. Are you with me? He will decompose. You see earthworms and everything acting on it. So when man dies, man will decompose. So organisms that carry out decomposition reaction, they are called what? Decomposers. Decomposers are organisms that carry out decomposition reaction, just like bacteria and some saprophytic organisms. They carry out decomposition reaction. So when man dies, ah, are you doing? Man will mix with dust and all that, then they react with man. Then at the end of the day, they will not add nutrients to the soil. When a living organism dies, it adds at the end of the day to add nutrients to the soil. So the whole thing will recycle again. Grass will make use of that nutrient. Uh, grasses will grow, go to feed on it, man will feed on it, and so on and so forth. So basically, we have what we call the consumer, we have the producer, and we have the word the decomposer. So now let's look at uh, the abiotic factor. The abiotic factor. Let's look at it. Abiotic factors are factors that are not living. The abiotic factors are, are basically temperature, temperature, wind, uh, okay, temperature, wind, humidity, light intensity. Temperature, wind, light intensity, turbidity, pH, turbidity, uh, pH, wind speed. So this one is wind direction, wind speed, humidity, light, turbidity, sunlight, sunlight, which can also be synonymous to light intensity. However, there are short discrepancy between them. So let's look at this abiotic factor, temperature. Temperature, a biotic factor. Now, temperature is the degree of hotness or coldness of a body. The degree of hotness or coldness of a body. Now, the instrument used in measuring temperature is called a uh, thermometer. It is called thermometer. I you know there are various types of thermometer. We have clinical thermometer, mercury in glass thermometer, resistant thermometer, we have thermocouple, and so on and so forth. Now, temperature affects organisms. In an environment, there are some organisms that will not exist. I use me beyond a particular temperature. And now there's something called optimum temperature. This temperature that is actually best uh, for a living organism. Now the normal human body temperature is at 37 degrees Celsius. Now basically it ranges from 35 to 42. So that means you can actually be at 35, 36, 37 like that, and 42. So this is normal, the average. Now beyond this, uh, there is a problem. Now we have wind direction. Wind is what we call moving air. Air that is moving is what we call wind. Wind is air in motion. Again, wind is air in motion. Now we have wind direction, we have wind speed. And our wind direction is measured by an instrument called wind vane. While wind speed is measured by an instrument called anemometer. And it's called what? Anemometer. Now we have humidity. Now what is humidity? What is humidity? Now, humidity is the amount of moisture that is present in the environment. Humidity is the amount of moisture that is present in the environment. It is measured with the instrument called what? Hygrometer. It is measured with the instrument called hygrometer. While relative humidity is measured with the instrument called hydrometer. Now, humidity is hygro, H-Y-G-R-O. Humidity is hygrometer. 
while relative humidity is hydrometer. Now, of light intensity. Light intensity talks about the efficiency of light, the, penet the penetrating ability of light. Light intensity is measured uh, using what we call what? Photometer. Photometer uses to measure light intensity or penetrating ability. Rainfall. What is rainfall? Rainfall or precipitation. Uh, the amount of uh, precipitation in the year. That's what we call rainfall. Rainfall is measured using rain gauge. You and I know that uh, the amount of rainfall in a particular area will determine the number of organisms that we found in that area. So in one way or the other, uh, these factors uh, speak loud on the population of organisms. These factors speak loud on how well organisms tend to move well in their environment. Now, what about we call turbidity? Turbidity is the muddiness uh, or the clearness of a water body. I don't know if you've ever been to a river before. Now, one thing you need to notice is if a water is very, very clear, sunlight will be able to penetrate easily but when the water is not clear the penetrating ability is hampered it is limited it is not that efficient so turbidity is the transparency of a water body the clearness or muddiness of a water body that's turbidity turbidity is measured using secchi disc secchi disc turbidity is measured using secchi disc now what we call ph ph is the degree of hydrogen concentration of a water body it is also the degree of alkalinity or acidity of a water body this water body is it alkaline uh, is it acidic or is it neutral the psk range is from 1 to 14 at uh, range 7 it is called neutral downward 7 downward to 1 it is acidity why uh, 7 upward uh, to 14 is what we call alkalinity what we call the wind speed which i've said earlier is measured using anemometer we have sunlight sunlight the energy from the sun the instrument is measuring the angle of the sun is what we call the sextance the sextant is what we call the sextant so basically these are the abiotic factors and they are actually more than this but what is just picked some of them and one again i would love to quickly talk about is pressure now pressure is force acting per unit area the pressure is measured using barometer it's measured using barometer at the top of a mountain what happens to pressure does it increase or decrease one thing you need to notice is the higher you go uh, the lesser the pressure at the top of a mountain pressure decreases now when you happen to see yourself inside the water are you with me now the the deeper you go the the more you see uh the more you experience an increase in pressure so all this you have to put to heart and you have to go and go over uh them again so basically now we would be moving and we'll be looking at uh biomes in nigeria so now we're on biomes. Uh, as I said, and I said biomes uh, is a large uh, terrestrial community of organisms. A large terrestrial community of organisms. And uh, now for the biomes, we have, we've got uh, local biomes and as well we have international biomes. Uh, we have local biomes. Uh, what do I mean by local biomes? Local biomes are those ones that are found in our country, Nigeria. Why international biomes are called world biomes? The general biomes. The world okay, so basically the local biomes that are found in Nigeria are majorly two. Uh, number one is what we call the forest and the other one is what we call the savanna. The forest and the savanna. Now, what is the major characteristic of the forest zone? The major characteristic of the forest zone is that they have tall trees. They have trees majorly. Why the major characteristic of the savanna is that they are mainly grasses the major characteristic of forests is that they have trees tall trees predominantly the major characteristic of savanna is that they are mainly grasses mainly grasses now the forest uh, zone is subdivided into two we have the rain forest and we have the mangrove swamp forest we have the rain forest and we have the mangrove swamp forest now let's come down to the savanna the savanna is subdivided uh, into many parts uh, but the notable ones uh, is what we call the sahel savanna sudan savanna and we have the northern guinea savanna now we have the uh, southern guinea savanna as well but these are the notable ones in nigeria the sahel savanna sudan and we have the northern guinea savanna are you with me sahel savanna sudan savanna we have the northern guinea savanna now it is also interesting uh uh for you uh, to note that we have desert in nigeria as well now the word desert what does it mean 
the word desert what does it mean now a desert is an area or a place uh, with little or no rainfall it is an area or a place with little or no rainfall now down uh to the northern part the border of shokoto and uh, across Kasina, we've got desert there there are some notable desert in nigeria as well now the world biomes the world biomes are basically the rainforest basically uh the rainforest the swamp the savanna the rainforest the swamp the savanna the afro alpine what the afro alpine the rainforest the swamp the savanna the afro alpine and the last is what we call the desert so basically these are the things you need to know under biomes the local biomes are forest and savanna Forest is mainly trees, tall trees, and white savanna is mainly grasses, and there's notably subdivided into three we have side savanna, Sudan savanna, and the northern Guinea savanna. And for the tall trees, we have the rainforest and we have the mangrove uh, swamp forest. Now, for the world biome, we have the rainforest, we've got swamp, we have savanna, we have the afro alpine, as well as uh, the desert. So, quickly, we'll be moving uh, into factors that are affecting uh, population, and that's what we'll be looking at factors that are affecting population so number one is what we call natality natality now natality is otherwise known as birth rate birth rate natality is otherwise known as birth rate and you and i know that in an area where there's an increase in birth rate then uh, there is bound to be a larger number of organisms there we have what we call mortality now mortality is what we call death rate Mortality is what we call death rate. You and I know that in an area where there is greater uh, number of death uh, situations or situations that lead to the extinction of an organism, uh, in that particular area, organisms uh, will likely be uh, in little number. Now, aside from natality and mortality, what we call competition. Now, this is one of the major factors that are affecting population. As I've said, uh, in some of our, our, our online sessions, I actually told uh, the, the student, I told the class then uh, that the resources that are present in the environment are limited, but the demand for them are actually increasing geometrically. So as a matter of that competition we set in, organisms that are fed, better fit to the environment will survive, while those that are not uh, uh, having what it takes to survive will go into extinction, they will die off. So we have natality, we have mortality, we have competition, as well we have what we call Okay, we've got uh, predation, what we call predation as well. Now, predation is a kind of association where a bigger organism feeds on a smaller organism. But the case these days is that it is not always a bigger organism feeding on a smaller organism. Uh, but on a lighter note, the bigger organism is called the predator, while the smaller organism that is being fed on is called the prey. But we've seen cases uh, where smaller organisms ask what it takes to feed on bigger organisms. So every organism uh, that lose uh, a fight uh, between another organism is referred to as a prey, while the one that, that happens to be the victor at the end is referred to as predator. So predation will lead uh, to the extinction or the dying off of some organisms. Uh, which you must know another one is pests and diseases but let's just take it as diseases now class what is a disease a uh, disease is an abnormal deviation uh, from the normal state of health of an organism uh, into an abnormal state okay i recap disease is a deviation from the normal state of health of an organism to an abnormal state when there is a deviation when a body is in a sickly state when a body is in a sickly state we say such a body uh, is diseased are you thinking? So disease are uh, affect what organisms? Disease affect organisms. So basically, we have natality death rate, we have mortality death rate, uh, we have competition, uh, we have predation, uh, we have diseases. Another one is we have food, food, food supply, food supply. In an area where there is food shortage, uh, organisms will uh, will try to. Uh, tolerate it uh, up to a certain extent then they will die off so food supply is also another another one that is notable is rainfall and rainfall directly or indirectly will affect food supply are you mean there are some organisms that are only seen when there's rainfall when there's no rainfall they are not seen so rainfall directly or indirectly will also affect them so these are some of the factors that are affecting population so quickly we'll now move uh, uh we'll move and we'll look at soil and soil factors okay so now we'll be looking at soil and soil factors now the question is is what is soil 
it have an idea. <laughs> so what I'm here to help you out. Now, soil is the topmost layer of the earth on which plants grow. Now, this is the earth's surface. The topmost layer of the earth, where we have growth of plants, is called soil. Soil is the topmost layer, or you can simply say the uppermost layer of the earth on which plants grow. The nutri the, the humus, or how do I say, the organic content of the soil, the organic content of the soil that makes plants grow is called humus. Again, soil is the uppermost layer of the earth on which plants grow. The organic content of this soil, the nutritive content of this soil is called humus. So humus is not a type of soil. Humus are, are, is a constituent of soil. It is not a type of soil. It is the makeup of a soil. I don't know if you're getting what I'm trying to say. It is not a type. It is part of a soil. It is the makeup, the constituent of a soil, not a type of soil. It is not a type of soil. I repeat for the last time, it is not a type of soil. It is the organic content of the soil. So that's what we call humus. Okay, I'm going to establish the definition of soil and uh, humus. I will now move further to look at the various soil types. The soil types. Now, there are basically three uh, types of soil. We have sandy soil. We have loamy soil. And we have clay soil. Now, one thing I need you uh, to know is this. Aside from these three basic uh, types of soil, there are other types of soil that are gotten as a result of combination of two or more types of soil. Like we also have what we call the sandy loam. So that's combination of sandy soil and loamy soil. What we call the clay loam. That's combination of clay soil and loamy soil. So these ones are gotten as a result of combination. But the basic types are sandy soil, loamy soil, and clay soil. Sandy soil, loamy soil, and clay soil. Now, sandy soil, as you all know, has a larger portion of uh, sand particles in it. Now, looking at these three types, the best soil for planting will always remain uh, loamy soil. Loamy soil is the best soil for planting. Why? Because it's, uh, it has what higher uh, content of humus. Humus can also be called the organic content. So it has high organic content. Now, clay soil is the best soil for molding. Are you mean it is sticky when well? Uh, uh, when you look at it, uh, percolation is actually why capillarity is low. So even the force of binding is, is very, very great. So uh, it absorbs water uh, very well and it becomes sticky. And it has the ability to form cast. It can be uh, used in molding and forming different type of things. I remember when I was little, I, I actually molded uh, a, a mod. I think it was a cup. A cup with two hand. Well, when, at the, as I time when I took it to school, the other hand was missing. You know the story. He fell down. So let me soil again remains the best soil for planting. White sandy soil uh, is actually used for constructional purpose and all that. But you still need to get familiar with this. So this is soil type: sandy soil, uh, loamy soil, and clay soil. Those are the basic soil types uh, that we have. Now we we'll quickly look at uh, soil factors. We we'll look at what we call soil factors. So let's go. The factors affecting soil uh, is what we call mm, organic content. So we're still looking at soil factors, uh, organic content. Now one thing I, uh, I want you to relate this with is that all these factors are responsible for the water holding capacity of the soil. I said we have three types of soil. We've got sandy, we have loamy, and we have clay soil. Now clay soil has the greatest uh, uh, retain, retaining ability. It has the greatest ability to retain water. So what are those factors uh, that could uh, be in support or, or against that factor? So one of them is organic uh, content organic content now organic content of the soil will to a large extent determine how nutritive or how, nu how nutritious that particular soil is for example loamy soil has the greatest organic content and that's why the loamy soil is the best soil for planting and all that now aside from organic content what we call clay content clay content clay content clay content now clay soil has the greatest uh, number of clay content and that's why it has greater uh, retaining ability it can retain water so we have clay content whatever we call soil size 
soy size, soy size, soy size. The size of the soy particles. Are they large or are they small? Now, smaller soy particles are is in support of clay soil having a great what retaining ability, ability to retain water. So soy size are that are small as a uh, foster the retaining ability of some soil such as uh, clay soil. So aside from uh, organic content, clay content and soil this thing we also have what we call ph now as i've explained earlier ph is the degree of acidity uh, or alkalinity of a soil so this to a large extent uh, will determine the characteristics of a soil so the the last but not the least is what we call okay is what we call the soil texture the soil texture now class what is soil texture Soil texture is the, the smoothness or roughness of the soil particles. Now, how do you get to know? You know by, by feeling. You know by sieving. There are two ways you can know. You know by sieving and you know by feeling. Now, when you feel it and you feel it is uh, somehow hard, you can say it is coarse. If you feel it is smooth, uh, then it is not coarse. You can say it is fine. Are you with me? So, you can know by feeling, you can know by sieving. You sieve it and you create a kind of pore. A kind of pore. If there are fine particles, they will pass through. If there are uh, bigger particles, they will not pass through, they will just stay in the sieve. Are you with me? So basically, we have our organic content, we have clay content, we have soil size, we have pH, and we also have soil texture. So with this, uh, we have a uh, uh, journey to the end of the class. Now, a brief uh, look at our uh, outline thus far. We've looked at the meaning of uh, ecology, we've looked at ecological concepts, uh, we look at components of an ecosystem. And I know some of you have been asking me, and I've spoken a lot about ecosystem. But I refuse to uh, say some uh, certain things about ecosystem. Now, everything that needs to be said, as I said, however, ecosystem is an interaction between living and non living components. Living components interacting with non living components is what we call ecosystem. The interaction between biotic factors and the abiotic factor is what we call ecosystem. Then we look at the biomes in Nigeria, uh, those are the local biomes, and we also look at, by extension, the world. Biomes. We look at factors affecting population and we look at soil and soil factors. Uh, some questions will uh, pop up on your screen. Uh, try as much as possible uh, to be attentive to those questions and try as much as possible to uh, prefer solutions to it. Uh, you know, we've provided with a lot of solutions, so it's high time you make use of it. Now, it's been a great uh, time out with you. Okay, now we've provided you with uh, uh, a wonderful uh, information filled video. So try as much as possible to go uh, through it. Uh, once or, or twice it will surely help it's been a great uh time out with you my uh my wonderful audience it's been a great time with you. peace